Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 186 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Dayan Goodenow, and the topic of the show is plasmalogens. Dr. Dayan Goodenow is a neuroscientist and founder and CEO of Prodrome Sciences. His research into the biochemical mechanisms of disease started in 1990. His curiosity about the biochemistry of life is as insatiable today as it was over 30 years ago. In those more than 30 years, Dr. Goodenow invented and developed advanced bioinformatic technologies, designed and manufactured novel supplements, and identified biochemical prodromes of numerous diseases, including Alzheimer's disease and dementia, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and numerous cancers. And now, my interview with Dr. Dayan Goodenow. I recently read Dr. Goodenow's book, Breaking Alzheimer's, A 15-Year Crusade to Expose the Cause and Deliver the Cure. Dr. Goodenow's work is cutting edge and provides hope for those concerned about cognitive decline and other neurological disorders. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Goodenow. Thank you, Scott. Happy to be here. First, what was the personal journey that led you to making neuroscience and ultimately plasmalogens a major focus of your life's work? Well, so really it starts with chemistry and physics and biology from high school, understanding these basic science questions. And then when you look into the, so my first degree is in in synthetic chemistry or organic chemistry, but even from high school, trying to understand how the world around us works. And you can look at biology as the interaction of organisms, and you can think of physics as the underlying matrix of reality, like we get down into the quantum mechanics of things. But when it comes to the living world that we live in, it's really chemistry. It's the biochemistry, it's the movement of atoms, if you will, and molecules. And the human body is this huge biochemical, self-perpetuating miracle, if you will. It's just quite, it's quite awesome. It's it's really hard for people to really to fathom the complexity of what a single human body can achieve. And so it goes into the chemistry side of things. And then when you start understanding how that works, then the chemistry of the brain really becomes the next process because that's really how do we really transcend from this consciousness to like biochemistry to consciousness. So we have the human brain is really a, a biochemical simulation of quantum mechanics. We've got such massive computing power that we can actually create kind of a that photon wave particle duality, right? Because it's it's really is it's an interesting thing. How do you choose to to eat a chicken salad versus a burger for lunch? Really, it's really quite the thing. The simplest things we take for granted is just really not simple when you really start trying to break it down to its smallest indivisible parts. So that's kind of where it goes. And then there's a practical aspect of work, right? Understanding technology, understanding you got to learn how to skate or dribble before you can make plays. So you have to learn the technology and the tools and all that stuff. And so that's where my my PhD is in in Department of Medicine, looking at neurochemistry, looking at the biochemical interactions of the brain related to refractory depression, psychiatric diseases, and that. And then that just one thing leads to another. So then we go to trying to understand this biochemical miracle we call life. We started in the ninth, you know, seventies and eighties really was a biochemistry driven world. Even from our medicinal chemistry of the of the fifties and sixties, where we started in- discovering drugs, they interacted with different receptors in the body. And then we had more biochemistry in the eighties and nineties. And then in the nineties, the genomics revolution really picked off. People started saying, you know what? We've understood that here's how many genes we have, here's how the introns and exons and how and the whole gene sequencing thing took off, the molecular biology. 
And it changed the way people thought about science. Science changed from a hypothesis testing model to a hypothesis generating model. Prior to the 90s, you would come up with an idea, you would design an experiment to test that hypothesis, try to make it fail, right? And so the, the default is that it's if you can't make it fail, you have to accept it for the period of time. We've lost that in science. We've 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 lost the fact that science, the job of science is to break things. We're in the business of failure. That's what science is about. It's how do you push things to its failure until you can't fail it again. And we've kind of lost that. It's become more hypothesis proving versus hypothesis failing. And so and we and people get attached to their hypotheses, and that's not really a good thing. Anyway, so when the genomics revolution really came across is that all this technology was being developed, massively parallel signature sequencing, gene chip arrays, and we could take a genome, whether it's a plant genome, a corn plant, or a mouse, or the human body, and we can map all the genes. And from those genes, we can predict their expression, the, the transcripts. And from those transcripts, we can predict which proteins are being created and how the genetic differences between individuals can make slight differences in the proteins. And that has a very seductive, logical, godlike feeling where you can understand everything, right? Because from the gene, every transcript can be found. From the transcript, every protein can be found. And so that gives you that kind of hierarchical structure. But the problem was that they didn't have, there wasn't a companion biochemistry technology that could measure metabolism or biochemistry at the level and scale that we could do genomics from. And that's a problem because see glucose in a plant and glucose in your cat and glucose in you is the same molecule, right? And so, so the biochemistry of our world is not species dependent. Okay. And so that kind of biochemistry transcends all species and all types of organisms. And it's virtually infinite in space. Like think about all of the functional med, like you've got clove oils and you've got extracts of this plant. And, and then you take a molecule, you take a simple molecule like caffeine and your body metabolizes it okay or the, and so the number of possible biochemical entities is larger than the number of particles in the universe it's it's fundamentally infinite in space so there's no way you can create a library of that it's not it's not philosophically possible to create a library so we need to have technology that we can actually measure it on demand and that's where my buildup of technology and training in, in advanced mass spectrometry ultimately led to saying, let's use ion cyclotron technology. Can we develop a technology that can be non-targeted in a sense that it has no a priori hypothesis as to what molecules are present, it just measures everything it sees. And we can, we, can, we can derive from that information what those molecules are. And this is what, was, this is what the genomics revolution changed in science. It says, you know what, let's, let's, let's just collect the data first and then let's compare someone with colon cancer to control or Alzheimer's and, and a cognitively normal person, and let's see what's different. Okay, that's not how we used to do things. We used to basically say, I think the cholinergic system is impaired. And then you design an experiment to test that particular thought. You don't, the, the change was, I'm gonna take a group of, group of people with disease A, and I'm gonna keep a group of people with disease B, and I'm just gonna look for everything. And then afterwards, I'm gonna see what's different. And I'm gonna, and based upon the differences, I'm going to derive a hypothesis as to why I see these differences. That that's a really major multi-hundred-year change in scientific thought that occurred literally within a few decades. And so that's kind of where I came in. So as I know it's a long story. So now I invented a technology <laughs> called non-targeted metabolomics. This ion cyclotron uses high field mass spectrometry, and um, I can measure thousands and thousands of things. And so it changed your whole view of biochemistry because we could measure things we could never, ever measure before. We could interpret things we could. And so then we started, apl started applying that across disease spectrums. And that really started understanding that that was the basis of beginning to understand really what health is and the difference between health and disease and the difference between the deviation from health or the loss of health versus the, the acquisition of a disease. And medicine has been focused on this, you get a disease, you acquire some negative thing. And if I remove that negative thing that you've acquired, you're going to miraculously become better. And that is just not true. 
Okay. And and that's where this and that's and that's where the the, the actual real data came to be. So anyway, that's a very long answer to your question, which is why <laughs> we have so many projects going on in so many diverse fields of science. You have studied the prodromes or fingerprints of many different diseases and disease states. And in looking at more than 20 of these prodromes, are there commonalities in terms of causes or in terms of potential solutions? What are the most common health negating and health promoting factors that you've identified? And how do we shift from these negative prodromes of disease and death to positive prodromes of vitality and longevity? Yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, so as you move up the causation hierarchy, okay, things be get sip, things become simpler and simpler. Because what happens health is I say health is a singularity, right? Your health, my health, everyone's health is exactly the same. There's no difference in health we deviate in disease and you take a simple disease like type 2 diabetes for example right so people have glucose dysregulation actually what they have mostly is is reduced fatty acid metabolism is really what causes type 2 diabetes but be that as it may it, now we have to predict okay we have this deviation from normality but is this person going to have cardiovascular disease are they going to go blind are they going to have neuropathy like what, what's what's the complication? What's what's going to be the downstream effect on this person from a relatively simple upstream causation cascade, right? And that's where we get stuck in the neat noise, right? Saying, okay, here's a product for diabetic neuropathy. Here's a product for cardiovascular disease. When these are dealing with symptoms or complications from an underlying upstream event. So yeah, so so as you so you have so certain deviations from normality can have a very diverse clinical spectrum. And that the diversity of the clinical spectrum comes in when you lay on that. Now you put that, that stressor on a group of people, then that stressor is going to have slightly different effects on different individuals. It's like someone coming into a lecture theater, wielding a two by four and yelling like a crazy man. Not everyone's going to respond to that two by four wielding crazy man exactly the same. Some are going to run, some are going to go under the table, some are going to attack the guy. Right. And so a, so a common one common event can elicit multiple diverse reactions to that event. And that creates the complexity of our typical world. And medicine, as a general rule, has been dealt with from a concept of someone is sick. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here in front of me and you're asking me what's wrong with me. And so it's a symptom based approach of saying there's a physical problem of some sort that I need to identify the, the, the immediate causation, do an assessment of acute mortality, right? Is this person going to die in the next 30 minutes, next 20 years, and, and make logical choices? And that is a logical cascade based upon what, and it's been based upon the concept of acute care medicine. And it's been extremely successful. So in sense that we don't die of these acute disorders very often anymore, right? So our ability to prevent premature death has been very good. Like over the last hundred years, we've 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 corrected. We, we don't die prematurely of most common things anymore, but that doesn't give us health. Okay, that what that relies upon is if I assuming that the person's endogenous normality is there. If I remove that stressor, the person can recover from their own underlying strength. Okay. And that model works as long as that person's underlying strength allows them to recover from the removal of the negative influence. But if people are weakened, even if you remove the toxin or you remove the stressor, the person doesn't have the strength to recover from it. And so the, so this is why we have recurrence of diseases in high, or much higher than initial incidence rates, right? People with colon cancer, they get surgical removal, they get a, a, a bill of good good health. They still will walk out of there with a much higher rate of future colon cancer than someone who never ever had colon cancer in the first place. Right. And that just makes and that makes logical sense when you think about it. So yeah, so when you look at these cascades, there absolutely is. There's a core there's, there's several core components of human cellular health, proxosomal function, mitochondrial function, your lipid regulation, that's probably one of the biggest things, like the cholesterol. We have this weird obsession with cholesterol that's that's not 
healthy because and, and the data just is not there. It's such a common risk factor. Your HDL and your total cholesterol levels, these things have large distributions of outcomes from cancers to everything else. This plasmalogen story is a really big hammer. The membrane, we can talk about that in a bit, that are, that are associated with decreased resilience, right? And then an oxidative stress. So the mitochondrial, that's it's so if you, if you start from the core, the core core of human viability, the core of human viability is the ability to take advantage of sunlight energy. Okay, so humans live on sunlight energy. And so plants take carbon dioxide and water, they use the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, and that and it captures that and they, the chloroplasts capture that energy into a hydrocarbon called glucose. And then that glucose gets converted into a bunch of other things. We make fatty acids, thousands and thousands of other things. But fundamentally, that's where it all begins. We get energy from the sun is trapped in a chemical bond called glucose. And the human body is a hybrid electric car. We are a hydrocarbon combusting organism that com that release that, that that releases that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, and we capture the energy from that from that combustion. And we kept in the energy from combustion then is used to charge a battery called our electron transport chain. And then we we discharge that battery. So there's just every just like your electric vehicle, you have a charging process and then you have a discharging process. The charging process is the combustion, creating carbon dioxide, just the way you heat your house, run your car. It's a release of energy. And then you charge the battery, which is this proton gradient in our mitochondria. But then we discharge it. And how we discharge it is when we, we breathe in oxygen, oxygen gets converted back to water. So it's a separate. And that's how so we convert oxygen back to water, which is basically just the, the discharge that's the, of, the, of the battery. That's the fundamental concept. We are literally on fire. Like the human body is burning on fire. It's, it's creating carbon dioxide and water. And it's doing it, think about this, it's doing this in a distributive battery model. Think of your Tesla car where every single piece of paint, every single piece of carbon, every single piece of metal that's in the engine, the fibers that are in the seats of the car, the, the, the rubber that's on the tire, every single one of them is the battery. Okay, that's the human body. Every single cell of the human body. We're talking hundreds of trillions, hundreds of trillions of battery cells fully distributed across the entire human body running 24 seven. And it's constantly charging and discharging. Okay, it's, it's a constant charge discharge battery. That is what runs the human body. It is really quite, it's, it's mind boggling. It's, it's really hard to even get your head wrapped around the enormity of this thing. So when you come back to this whole process, I would talk about plasmalogens and membranes and we get all these things, but really human life first survives on, on that mitochondrial process. And then, then everything kind of gets built around it, peroxisomal function, our membrane structure, our body is built on these apartment complex of cells that have the, the three-dimensional, like our ability to compartmentalize, right? Just like your house, like compartmentalize what you do in your kitchen versus what you do in your bedroom, which what, what you do in the living room. And so things can happen in certain areas without disrupting other areas. My heart can function without disrupting my brain, for example. That's all done by compartmentalization. And that compartmentalization is all membranes. That's that's three dimensions, and that's the and the biological membranes of the human body, just like the car, the plaster on your walls. But it's all made with biological material. It's made with with phospholipids, and 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 then that quality of that phospholipid, like whether or not that wall can stand without falling down, right? And if you have if if the composition of your walls change, you'll have differences. Your floor and your walls and your ceiling. The different rooms of your home, your outer walls of your house will be, have a different structure to your just separating internal rooms of your house. So you can just think about that. Your, your human body does that on a huge scale. And that's and it's, and it's built that way. And that's where, so when that starts to disrupt, okay, it has other impacts. And so these are the, so if you, if you start with the core structural physiological aspects of it, these are all at the chemical level, biochemical, and they're tightly regulated. The human body is designed to work and it works incredibly well. And so that's where, as you start 
working down that actual cascade, that's where you start seeing the largest health benefits. That's why low cholesterol, for example, has such a huge distributive death rate or your your membrane structure, like the plasmalogens are when we lose. There's another one with, with aging. Oxidative stress is when your mitochondria aren't, that battery is leaky and that energy now it's it's not being converted it's like your battery smoking and chart and sparking and 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 it, it, the rest of the body and we have all these backup mechanisms to compensate for that and those will work to a certain degree but if those become overwhelmed then eventually the body will adapt and it will try to decide what kind of sophie's choices it has to have Okay, am I going to let this cell die or am I going to let this cell die? It's going to start making choices or or what functions am I going to lose? Okay, I, I can't do everything anymore. So now I got to saw the body has to decide what's going to it's going to to maintain and which it's not going to maintain. So anyway, so, so that's I know a big philosophical. So that but, but as you look yourself down there, so when we talk about health deviation, this is what becomes so powerful because we actually know what health is. Okay, once you start studying health, you don't have to study disease. All you have to do is study deviation from health. Okay, I don't have to study engine seizures of your car. Okay, I just need to study oil usage, measure the oil, make sure it doesn't get below. I don't have to wait. So here's a deviation from normality. So if this is how a car engine is supposed to run, and I can measure the parameters of a properly operating engine, then I just need to keep an eye on that. And when one of those factors gets out of whack, right? You need to fix it. You don't really need to really say, okay, is this lack of oil? That's a bad example, but what's the ultimate end result of that? Because all these risk factors, take a BRCA gene mutation, for example, or you take these things that we talk about with really strong associations. Well, at a pure percentage level, these things are very small. And most people with, with a BRCA mutation will not get breast cancer. Okay, so you have the risk factor, and so you can have these stressors. And just like a car, if you take a thousand cars and put just the minimum amount of oil in the crankcase, okay, they're not all going to fail right away. Some can run for a long. You'd be surprised. We used to do this university. We do a rally. We'd take a car and we dump all the oil out of the crankcase, and then you would predict how many miles a car would run before it stops. And that's what we would use as a as a raffle for, for raising money. But you'd be surprised at how far a car can run with no oil. So and so the human body is the same way. You, you'd be just because you've got this deviation from health, it's quite amazing how long we can live in a in a bad stress environment. And that's that's the, and that makes it difficult for us because some of these things that occur to us, we don't see the real negative consequence for years later. You say that plasmalogens are the lipids of life. So talk to us about what are plasmalogens, where are they produced in the body, how does the body create them, and where do they then reside in the body or have their primary biological effects? Is that in the cell membrane? What is their role in supporting optimized health? Yeah, so plasmalogen is a wonderful story because it is one of those things that go that just, that just hits you out of left field and you go, how? How is it possible that we have not been which, looking at this thing? So plasmalogens are a phospholipid, a membrane. And so the, when I was talking about those walls of the human body, the body makes walls using what's called a phospholipid bilayer. And it makes it with biological material. It's like soap, basically, in your, in your kitchen. And you have a part of the, the phospholipid molecule likes to be in the oil, and part of it likes to be in water. And when you mix them together, the, the oil components mix together, and the and the polar separate part and it creates a biological wall with this fatty with this oily center and then this polar charge outside and then you basically have a wall in water and so that that wall material is made and it's and it has a bunch of phospholipids in it different types phosphocholine ethanolamine so plasmalogens fundamentally are one of those types of lipids and it's not a small amount we're talking 20, 30% of your entire phospholipid volume of your brain. 50% of the lipids of your heart that are involved, and this is why we have this huge problem with, with myocarditis, with, with the COVID and the vaccines, people that are, and these sudden death syndromes that are occurring. And these plasmalogens, we're not talking about a trace level in the human body. We're talking very, very large amounts in the human body, almost like the level of cholesterol, that level of high, high, high levels. And so, and it's in every single cell of your body. So it's not just, oh, it's just something in your heart or just something in your brain. 
So that's fundamentally what they are. And the absolute requirement for human life of plasmalogens is best represented by these rare diseases in children that have plasmalogen deficiencies due to genetic mutations. And the, the, the classic plasmalogen deficiency disease is a, is a disease called rhizomelic chondrodysplasia punctata, or RCDP. It's about a one in a hundred thousand live birth rate, so it's an ultra rare disease. Children typically die before age ten, so it's it's a mortality. So if you if you're born without plasmalogens, you do not live; you die. Okay, your body will you will die, and it's it's a horrible situation. They're neurologically challenged. They have dwarfism. They ultimately die of heart failure or or uh, or lung failure. And so I have a big charity for these children. And so we're having dramatic response rates in them by re restoring their plasmalogen levels. So again, this is where you can where you can compensate or you can even bypass genetic issues, which you know, biochemistry. So biochemistry can bypass virtually almost virtually every genetic risk factor there is out there. But so that tells you how bad, how important plasmalogens are. And so why they're important and why they're so strange, it's like cholesterol in, in in a sense because we don't get very much cholesterol from our diet okay plants there's no cholesterol in any plants you get some from animal products we get some from our eggs but fundamentally the human body makes all of its own cholesterol okay 80 90 percent of all your cholesterol comes from, and every single cell your body makes cholesterol plasmalogens kind of have a similar situation we get virtually no plasmalogens from the diet the only time we get plasmalogens from the diet is when we were being breastfed by our parents or my mother the breast human breast milk has high levels of plasmalogen precursors and it's designed for the, the white matter structure but then of course that goes away because we're not bread fest in our 50s and so the so that's where the natural source of the plasmalogens are after that we make 100 percent of them internally for the most part and we usually make quite a bit of them we're really good at it it's made in a certain cell called the peroxisome and every single so your body doesn't even it's so important in the human body that it won't even rely on dietary supply. It says, "No, we got this. We're going to make it ourselves." Okay, it's a so. Then, but that's it. That's it's also it's Achilles' heel. And so it means if you if you lose your plasmalogen manufacturing capacity at some point in time in your life through either toxicity or atrophy, then your your body comes out of balance. It's expecting a certain amount of plasmalogens. It's not getting that amount, and then deviations from health occur and so the core component of the plasmalogen is why they're what, what they actually do the most important there's about four functions one that we talk about for alzheimer's is the synaptic membrane connection between neurons so again everything in the human body is done biologically but interestingly enough so many things in our regular world work on the same logic just like the light switch on your wall right you got a switch you got a wire that's running through the wall. No, it's, there's, there's not a whole bunch of sparks going through your wall, right? You don't want that. And then it connects to your light bulb. And so you click this, flip the switch, electricity goes through the wire. And then the, at the end, that wire, the coating of the wire is taken off and it either connects or doesn't connect. And that's, a, that, that's an electrical connection, right? And we do that with physical material, with plastic and copper. Human body, of course, is not made of plastic and copper. It's made of biological material. So everything you think you, we've done in our regular world, the human body does that with biological molecules and cells. It's a living, it's, it's a living thing, right? So the copper wire in your wall, in the human body, that copper wire is a living organism. Okay. It's living and live and it's, and it's being, it's being maintained and regenerated every single day of your life. It's alive. And, and, and it's, and so when it, when one, neuron or one wire connects to another wire in the human body there's a what's called a synapse and one cell has to then communicate to the next cell and how it does that is by releasing what's called neurotransmitters and these neurotransmitters are released by this fusion and it's like your shower head you just turn your shower head on and off on and off and you get this little pulse of uh of of water that's what's happening between cells a little pulse 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 but that ability to open up a cell, release its content, and then close back down again. It's called membrane fusion. And that process requires plasmalogens. In fact, 75% of the ethanolamine phospholipid has to be plasmalogen or more to get that to work. So soon as plasmalogen levels decrease in your brain, that function decreases and cognition. And that's why the plasmalogen levels in the brain are so highly correlated with cognitive function. So it's a really straightforward biophysical 
process. Okay, that's one one core component, and that's the omega three, the DHA, the polyunsaturated. You know, and that's why fish oils and things have some level of effect because at least you get an added effect. But plasmalogens are not in fish oil, just to be clear. A fatty acid is in that. So that's car- that's really core component number one of plasmalogens is, is actual synaptic function and your neuromuscular function. Okay, so the, the connection of your neuron to your muscles is also a synapse. It's called a neuromuscular junction. Same type of neurotransmitter as is in your brain, called acetylcholine. And so that's why when you see people with Alzheimer's, as they regress, of all the neurological diseases you'll see, Alzheimer's has the most people in wheelchairs, right? Very common. You see this loss of mobility coincides with the loss of cognitive functioning. So mobility and cognition go hand in hand in human life and, and survival. So that's one core component. So the second part is actually that the coating on that wire, the plastic coating that's on your wire in the human body is called myelin. And you have a cell in the brain called oligodendrocytes and your cells in your periphery are called Schwann cells. And they make that they make that plastic coating and that plastic coating is called myelin that's the that's what the omega-9 plasmalogen does and that's the actual molecule that's in human breast milk so mother's milk contains the omega-9 plasmalogen it's designed specifically for that myelination process and 70 80 percent of the ethanol means is plasmalogen it's actually the highest concentration of plasmalogens in the entire body so all this connected tissue so that's those are two really core things. Then when you talk about this whole membrane composition, so all these proteins that people talk about, these proteins are not just floating around in your body. These p- proteins are are stuck in your membranes. They're like your windows and your vents of your house. Okay. They're 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 not just floating in space. Like they're 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 attached, they're 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 secured in that membrane. And they function, their function of those proteins is dependent upon the composition of the membrane around them and so the membrane composition changes all of a sudden the windows are stuck you can't open them or or whatnot plasmalogens are critical for that so cholesterol regulation and transport to reverse cholesterol transport that people talk about hdl highly highly dependent like the foamy macrophage atherosclerotic plaques that whole process where the cholesterol misregulation occurs oxidate and and the oxidation of membranes plasmalogens play a critical critical role of that amyloid formation in the brain, for example, the plasmalogen levels are high determiner of that amyloid plaque. So that's number three. And number four, so and that, there's multiple enzyme protein systems that are affected by plasmalogen changes. Number four is it's really an antioxidant fire hose. It's, it's really a physical fire hose to reduce oxidative stress. And that's what's going on with people with this myocarditis right now. The, the the sudden heart attack situation is is actually being caused by fundamentally plasmalogen depletion of the heart from COVID. COVID specifically depletes your plasmalogens. And so it's a big deal. And so that's why we're having all this myocarditis situations. So what happens when your body's inflamed, that special bond in plasmalogens that I didn't mention is a little bond called vinyl ether bond. And it's basically like a fuse. It really, it's really like a fuse. And it, it's designed to break first before something else goes wrong. And your body makes these plasmalogens and stores them in your membranes. Okay, so all these cell walls, okay, they're not just there to make you look pretty. They're actually physically got stuff in them. And when you have an inflamed event, it releases these plasmalogens from the membrane and it just douses the fire. It's like throwing water on a fire. And then once the fire is out, your body has to rebuild the reservoir. It's like a, having a lake next to your, your your town. Fire happens. Fire trucks come in, pump a hose into the lake, and start pouring water on the fire. And that's okay if you only use up half your lake and the fire is out. And say, okay, well, two more it takes me two years to rebuild the lake, but it's going to gradually fill up again. But if you run out of water before the fire is out, now you're stuck with just a small trickle of water that's not enough to work. And that's what's happening in some of these long COVID situations and other things. So, so it's a it's a power, it's a really powerful fire hose. And so this is what happens. So when you start getting when these things decrease with age, they they peak around our 40s and 50s. And then for numerous reasons, they we stop, we start making less and less of them. And then as we make less and less of them, the body gradually adapts and tries to adjust to 
the, the different environment and eventually it can't and eventually it can't adjust anymore and we have disease in the book you talk about the role of plasmalogens in the cell membranes in the nerve function arena you also note that besides the brain they're high in the heart the kidneys the lungs the eyes and that while they're mostly made in the liver every cell in the body can make them and does contain them so does increasing plasmalogen levels improve the health of the heart, the kidneys, the lung, the eyes, and other parts of the body, in addition to what we see with cognitive function with the brain, or is their primary role in our health more synapse, neuron, brain function? How broadly do plasmalogens support systemic health? It's been so surprising. So since we're now in the world, right, and we have thousands and thousands of people taking plasmalogen precursors and the responses that we get back are far, far more diverse than originally anticipated. Okay. So first the obvious, first and foremost was the cognitive improvement. Okay. We published, we did a clinical trial, got dramatic cognitive improvement in a relatively short period of time. Okay. And that's all published in Frontiers of Medicine. And so clearly brain fog, cognitive improvement almost invariably improves. Like it's 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 almost it's I, I really can't think of examples where people don't come back to us and say, my brain awareness have improved and people and their family members. Like it's it's a very, very high percentage. And so that's clearly the low that happens. Now, when it comes to autism and the neural inflammation of the the brain inflammation and the the disruption of myelination that occurs with brain inflammation, that has been just really dramatic improvements in individuals. This concept of inflammation of the brain and the ability to resolve it, at a, and it happens faster than we would have ever anticipated. It's not this really long months after months after months. People start seeing differences in weeks, in days even. It's, it's really quite remarkable and unpredictable. It just really, it's, if you hit the right button, you see dramatic improvements in individuals. Then in terms of really acute care emergency room situations where people are on a ventilator and they've lost oxygenation of the lungs, they take start taking the proton glia, the omega-9, and literally they leave the hospital in two days. It's hard to even get your head wrapped around. People will explain like with with, with myocarditis long term, they they say, I can actually feel it in my heart when they start taking and it's because we're not just poking, we're not tweaking something. It's actually a physical building block it's physically sucked into your cells so yeah so these kind of things so clearly uh, as, as a general rule the the omega-9 the omega-9 plasmalogen precursor sleep neurological calming autism ms those type of situations highly high percentage of people get significant benefit from it and then the neuro is more of that activating omega-3 so improving neuromuscular function improving cognitive function, improving mobility and energy and just awareness. That is is the biggest thing people see. So yeah, so it's a it's a big deal. C-reactive proteins, like as soon as you start taking the omega-3 plasmalogens, you're, if you have high CR, CRP, it brings it down. Malondialdehyde levels, like your oxidative stress markers come down, your catalase levels come back up. It's 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 pretty remarkable stuff. I was going to ask this question later and maybe not not go too deeply into it, but one of the researchers that I have talked to about plasmalogens has suggested that in autism and ALS, that plasmalogen levels are often already elevated. And so I'm wondering if that's something that you see as well. Are there certain conditions where plasmalogen precursor supplementation may not be advantageous because maybe there are already elevations of plasmalogens? Oh, that's a good question. But so it's important to remember the plasmalogens in your blood don't cross the blood brain barrier okay so you can have high levels in your blood and that has no impact on the human brain for the most part okay so when we're measuring blood levels of plasmalogens we're measuring the the excess output of your cells okay so the plas some of some of the plasmalogens from the from your blood supply will go into your mem into your cells but fundamentally it's the other way around okay the blood the, the the plasmalogens that are that are in your blood they're coming out of your cells Okay, they're kind of like the HDL system. So when you have high levels of HDL cholesterol, it means your cells are doing are really healthy because they're they're making their cholesterol and they're exporting it and they're sharing it. They have they have more they have they're they're putting energy back in the grid, so to speak, right? 
And so that's where that comes in. So in terms of ALS, autism, so those are actually really, really different. I think you may have meant multiple sclerosis. So diseases of mitochondrial failure, like MS and autism, okay, or mitochondrial, what happens in those situations is you have the mitochondrial function gets impaired and the mitochondria start stop doing its job or is unable to do its full job in the cell. And so parts of the other cells start taking over and saying, or, or trying to help. And that's when the peroxisome starts helping out the mitochondria. So a whole bunch of palmitic acid and things that are supposed to go into your mitochondria now go into your peroxisomes, and that turns on that peroxisomal function. So ex- overactive peroxisomal function in autism and MS is actually an indicator that the mitochondria are stressed. And that will cause plasmalogen levels to go up in the blood. But that's not necessarily a good. It's a double-edged sword. It's good in certain aspects, but it's not helpful for the brain. And so in those diseases, autism and multiple sclerosis, those are white matter diseases. Those are diseases of myelin breakdown. And the question is, is how and why does the myelin get disrupted? And the disruption of the myelination is caused by inflammation. Okay, It's caused by the microglia in the brain. And this microglial inflammation actually blocks or or it stresses the oligodendrocytes and the myelination and it disrupts that myelination. So autism is a disease of, of impaired connectivity and it's it's a disrupted myelination process. And it's more of a, a global situation where MS is a focal lesion type process, but it's the same biochemical concept. And so, yeah, so the omega-9 plasmalogens are very powerful in those diseases because it actually goes in and just, it's, it's like this whole water and fire story I was telling you about. It's like bringing in plane loads of water from the neighboring lake, okay, to help out. So when, you, when you're taking plasmalogen precursors, you're actually saying, hey, here's some more. We'll, 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 we'll supplement what your, cell, what your oligo dendrocytes are trying to make. And if we help, you can now catch up. And all of a sudden, this myelination gets back on track. And this is what happens with the children, why they start getting better very dramatically with that. And in MS, you can stop the demyelination phase. So that's where ALS is very different. ALS has low plasmalogens. ALS has, uh, it's actually, there's some mitochondrial component of it, but I have a number of patients with MS that we we, we, we deal with, but their plasmalogen levels are really low. And so there's a proxosomal failure. And there's a whole bunch of other things to talk about for ALS and copper transport and, and stuff like that. I know there is a difference between the omega-3 plasmalogen precursors and the omega-9 plasmalogen precursors, but just at a high level, what are some of the conditions where increasing plasmalogen levels may be a worthwhile exploration to improve health outcomes? Well, cognitive impairment, number one, brain fog, dementia, absolutely Parkinson's, omega-3 plasmalogens are just hands down the first go-to in those type of situations. Cardiovascular disease, omega-3 plasmalogens, okay? If, if you've got oxidative stress, high levels of oxidative stress, like maldialdehyde elevation or C-reactive protein elevation, or you have low HDL levels, omega-3 plasmalogens, okay? Those will help improve your cholesterol transport, reduce your oxidative stress levels, improve your vascular function, hands down, omega-3. for all. So all those where you need to enhance function, okay? You need to turn the volume up of a system, the omega-3 plasmalogen, the DHA plasmalogen does that. For all your kind of protective mechanisms, when the body is inflamed and you're saying, hey, I, I don't want to turn the volume up. I want to turn the volume down. Like I need to calm the system down. Okay, I need to calm the neural inflammation down. I need to calm down the optic neuritis or peripheral nerve issues. Omega-9 plasmalogens, okay? Because those deal with... So that's what's... So the omega-9 plasmalogens, they restore the coating on the wire in your walls. Okay. So if you have a big inflammation going on and your wiring in your walls is leaky and the signal's not getting all the way there and it's a bunch of noise and that's what's causing the inflammation in your head is just, you can't sleep. You're in so these kids with pandas or autism that that's a, that's inflammation is driving them crazy. Right. And so you, you talk about even bipolar and um, autoimmune related disease issues when you have you know, when you have autoimmune is primarily a mitochondrial overload situation so omega-9 plasmalogens dramatically improve that core heart function core lung function when you're in that acute disease state the omega-9 plasmalogen 
is really quite powerful in that 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 core structural rebuilding process. So they they have a yin and yang approach. approach to it. So normally, I recommend people take the omega nine at night for the most time. Like it helps build overnight time. You sleep better, and then omega three during the morning, and that helps activate you. And then you have this yin and yang. Your your body, the human body, has to have a controlled stress response activity for everything we do. Like it's a perpetual motion machine. Your body never stops. Right? Your heart never stops. Your body, your body never stops. So all you can do is make sure that you are creating an environment that it's constantly adapting to a healthy situation. So for our listeners, we'll talk more about this later, but the omega-3 plasmalogen precursor, that's the prodrome neuro product, and the omega-9 plasmalogen precursor is the prodrome glia product, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Wanted to just kind of get an understand about understanding around plasmalogens at different stages of life. So from reading the book, my understanding was that kind of in that 40, 50, 60 range is when plasmalogens are the highest, when we're younger, they're lower, when we get older, they start to decline. What is it that causes them to increase in that 40 to 60 age group? And then what is it that causes them to decline as we get older? That's a really good point. Because when you're measuring things, this is the other part when you're talking about advanced interpretation of laboratory results. Okay. Sometimes you, you, lab results are biomarkers. They're metrics for us to look behind the curtain. Okay. We need to infer from those results. Like remember, we're measuring a blood sample, right? We're not measuring a piece of your brain or a piece of your muscle. Okay. So we have to infer as to how the body is resulting in these blood marker levels that we see. Okay. There's an interpretation and an understanding that, that comes in. It's a, it's a language. It's, it's a very powerful language to, to learn. So Plasmalogen levels go up, but they go up for a different reason than people think. So first of all, they're low when we're young. When we're born, we're actually born plasmalogen deficient. Okay, Our bodies, for the first six months, that's why breastfeeding is so important. So the human body doesn't actually build up its own internal plasmalogen manufacturing capacity for the first six months or so. And of course, every child is going to be a little bit different, right? Some will be younger, some will be older. It's just the way, way life is. And that's important because that myelination of the brain is so critical. But after about the first year, it catches up. And then we have this slow elevation in the blood going up. But it's not because we're making more plasmalogens. It's because the lake, the reservoir, gets full. Okay? And so what, what you're measuring in the blood is the overflow from the lake. Okay? And so, so if the lake is full... And we, we continue to myelinate the, the, our, the, this whole reservoir, which is all the white matter of your brain, all the white matter of your tissues. Your body's been making plasmalogens ever since birth. And it's been filling it in the membranes, plugging it in here, plugging it in there, and it's building up over time. And then at some point, you get more and more full, right? But if you're still making plasmalogens, if you're making plasmalogens and the reservoir is full, then you're going to see a larger spillover into the circulation, saying, hey, Excellent. Okay, we, you're making more than you're, you're making more than the lake needs, the reservoir needs. Then eventually, what happens is you stop making enough, and when your plasmalogens in the blood go down, that tells you that hey, okay, the lake's being drained. Okay, so so now the water going into the lake, a lot of that's being used up, and and the lower the plasmalogens start tr trickling down in your blood. That tells you that the bigger drain that's occurring on that system, that system is getting drained more and more and more. And so the delta, the, so what happens is the lower your plasmalogens are in your blood, that tells you how quickly the lake is running dry. Okay. And that's why it predicts the rate of cognitive decline. So plasma, low plasmalogens don't just predict dementia in the elderly population. It predicts the rate of decline of that dementia. It predicts the rate of death, how the time to death is predicted based upon the level. So it's it's a it's a quantitative prediction model. And, and it's because when it's too when the lower it is, it just tells you how quickly you are declining. And so that's kind of where the blood levels are. So that's why it peaks. The reason why it peaks in our 40s and 50s is because we've been myelinating. If you if you've maintained your health up to that level, okay, you're good. You're 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 muscles, your heart, 
they're basically full of plasmalogens. Our brain is still myelinating. The white matter of our brain is still increasing in our 40s and 50s. Okay. And so that means you're full. And then at some point in time, reduced reduced mobility. We don't move as much later on in life. We don't a bunch of other things that contribute to that normally stimulate plasmalogen manufacturing decrease. And then you have a with time, you have the increased risk of of adverse reactions from drugs. You're taking this and that and the other thing, and they all have they all have little death by a thousand cut type effects on your system. So what are some of the factors then that might lead to lower than optimal plasmalogen levels over time? Is it aging? Is it environmental toxicants, other cellular stressors? And are there ways to optimize maybe our peroxisomal function and plasmalogen production endogenously without relying solely on the use of exogenous plasmalogen precursors? Yeah, the biggest drivers of plasmalogen manufacturing and the biggest reasons why they decrease with age or in other circumstances is two things. One, the failure to maintain a fasting state of the human body. Okay, so plasmalogens are made in peroxisomes. And the human body, I tell people, we the human body is designed to run in the fasting state. We eat a meal simply to refill our fat cells, and then, our, then we run off of our adipose tissue for the rest of the day. That's how the human body is supposed to operate. And when you're in the fasting state, your body is running off of fatty acid energy from your fat cells. And that's when the peroxisomes are in uh, full form and they make plasmalogens during that period of time. Okay, You also make your cholesterol, you do your regular, all your hormones. That all occurs when your body's in the fasting state. When you're in the fed state, you're all running on glucose, pure mitochondrial function. Okay, so number one, this late night eating, eating all day long, high glycemic food type diets all reduce the number of hours per day that your body's in a fasting state. And the second one is muscle atrophy. Okay, so the skeletal muscle system, your body is designed to have a certain amount of skeletal muscle, certain amount of of non-skeletal cellular systems. Your skeletal muscle runs on fat. Okay, your heart, your skeletal muscles, they're primarily they run on fatty acid energy, not glucose energy. And so they are big contributors to plasmalogen manufacturing. So that's why, so that's why resistance training has such a powerful effect in, in the de- dementia, for example. So fasting and resistance training, two of the most powerful things that you can do physiologically to improve cognition and reduce dementia rates are the two most pro-plasmalogen producing behaviors that you can do. That's awesome. Love that. So that's 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 the that's, those are the two main main factors. When we think about Alzheimer's, we look at the Bredesen Recode framework. There's multiple subtypes, including the inflammatory, atrophic, glycotoxic, toxic, vascular, and traumatic subtypes. There are many holes in the roof that contribute to cognitive decline, as Dr. Bredesen teaches. Many of these are what we would think of as more root causes. And in your book, you suggest that plasmalogens may be a cure for Alzheimer's. Does this mean that the plasmalogens are addressing the root causes or holes in the roof, or are they instead not allowing these insults to damage the structures in the brain that are involved in cognition? I know in the book, you say health is not the absence of disease, but the maintenance of functional reserves. In other words, not waiting for the gas in your car to run out and the engine stopping before you refill the tank. So our plasmalogens essentially bypasses such that even if someone has infections, maybe viruses or other toxicants such as mold or mycotoxins that could lead to Alzheimer's, that they're essentially shielded from the damaging effects from the plasmalogens. Well, simple answer is yes for that. It's all diseases are a combination of two components. Okay, One is the susceptibility that the person has for the disease. And the other one is the strength of the stressor that's being put on the human body, okay? And it's like a bald tire versus a brand new tire, okay? You can have a brand new tire, but you can still get a flat. If you hit if you hit a big enough nail, the best tire in the world is going to go flat, okay? But probabilistically speaking, it's going to be less likely than a bald tire. So with a bald tire, just a little rock can make your flat tire, right? And so the the outcome is a flat tire. So in order to get a flat tire, two things have to 
be combined. One, the stressor has to be greater than the, the, the resilience of the system. Okay. And so I can now say, oh, hey, I got a ball tire. I'm going to go make sure I go around. I'm going to sweep all the roads in my city so that I make sure I never drive over a nail. Okay. That's, that's, the, that's the remove all possible negative situations. So I want to make it so that it's safe for me to drive on ball tires. Okay. That's, that's, the, that's the remove all disease causing mechanisms approach. And that is fundamentally good, right? You can, you, you've, you've reduced that, that negative stressor on the system. The other side of it is that people forget, even with cancers or anything, those type of cells, the number of cells that are actually unhealthy are a very, very small fraction versus all the cells that remain their health. And so by increasing the strength and resilience of the surrounding cells, you can shrink cancers. You can, and so it's a matter of commandeering the rest of the body to make it inhospitable for these negative influences to occur. Doesn't mean these negative influences aren't real because we can do the science. We can say, hey, that's it's there. If you have this infection, you're going to have this outcome. That's all true. Okay, so the the question now, though, is that once you remove those those negatives, it's dependent upon the human body's underlying resilience that determines whether you're how well you recover from it. Okay, because you're you're removing a negative, and, and the underlying system has to bounce back. And so, but a lot of times you can actually fix the underlying system and these other problems just disappear. Vascular flow rates to the brain, for example, if you want to look at neurovascular coupling, like you can do all this by MRI and so on and so forth. So, so anyways, the answer to that question is yes. My fundamental belief is that for all of these stressors of the human body, the first good example is take, take COVID or take some, not everyone with COVID dies. So the fact that certain humans can be exposed to a stressor and still thrive under that exposure level tells us that increased resilience is always a stronger clinical program than removing toxins. Animal models for demyelination, Cooperzone, for example, okay, highly toxic, highly reproducible demyelinating stressor. If you give animal pl plasmalogens and then you give them Cooperzone, they don't demyelinate. Okay, so in the presence of a completely well-documented, absolutely nasty, nasty demyelinating stress, if these animals have the plasmalogens, in they, 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 it's like they don't even have Cooperzone. It turns it into candy. Or MPTP, which we, we use for, for, for killing dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease. If the animals have the plasmalogens before the MPTP, okay, it doesn't kill any dopaminergic neurons. So that those things tell us that under, underlying resilience, okay, pound for pound, has a much stronger window of utility than chasing after every single possible bad thing that could be affecting my life. So my takeaway from that was that plasmalogens are essentially a way to increase our vitality or to raise our vibration. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Bredesen's talked about APP or amyloid precursor protein as being key in the development of Alzheimer's that we can either be in this building or blastic state or breaking down or clastic state. So are plasmalogens then impacting the expression of APP and influencing whether we move in a building or breaking down direction? Yeah. So APP, amyloid precursor protein, is a critically important protein for human life. Okay. Just for doing for an example, it is not possible to develop animal APP negative animal models. Okay. Life cannot occur without APP being present. And so it, it, it's it's an absolute requirement. And so amyloid precursor protein, APP, gets processed by two different mechanisms. One creates what's called secretory APP alpha, S APP alpha. And that is one of the most powerful neurogenic stimulators in the brain it's a drug it's it's an amazing molecule itself it comes directly from app when app gets metabolized by an enzyme called alpha secretase it creates this s app alpha which is one of the most powerful neurogenic for neurogenesis very very powerful. It, it, it's the human brain 
needs that to grow and develop 100%. And that's what 90% or more of APP is used for. So most, the very, maybe 95% or more of APP gets converted to soluble APP alpha. The toxic part or the, the negative part is the beta amyloid. And that's when APP gets processed by beta secretase. And that is a small component of the APP cascade. These two enzymes exist in two different parts of your membrane. The alpha secretase is in the phospholipid rich region, which contains the plasmalogens. And the beta secretase is in the what's called the lipid raft region, high cholesterol sphingomyelin zone, okay, the, the dense part. And when the, the when we age, what happens is when we lose plasmalogens, the the amount of our membrane that becomes high cholesterol with rafts increases, and the amount of our membrane that becomes this phospholipid rich region decreases. So what happens is the amount of soluble APP alpha decreases, the amount of beta amyloid increases. And the reason why, so plasmalogens, so people with high DHA plasmalogens, okay, have low amyloid, and they have high alpha secretase activity, which gives them high neurogenesis capacity. And that's the, where the body wants to stay healthy. And then the people with low plasmalogens have high beta secretase. And the other flip side of the coin, the other reason why we know so much about this is because of the genetic predispositions, the, the APOE4 alleles. You have the E2 carriers, E3 carriers, E4 carriers. And these three types of alleles affect this cholesterol efflux rate of neurons. And that affects the... The, that lipid raft composition and directly affects the alpha secretase to beta secretase activity. So neither one of them have anything to do with Alzheimer's, fundamentally. Amyloid has absolutely nothing to do with Alzheimer's or dementia. It's just a bystander on the road watching an accident happen. So let's talk a little bit about the APOE4. So often this APOE4 predisposition is almost itself perceived as a death sentence for people mentally and then possibly even epigenetically influencing gene expression. They can often feel very hopeless when they find out that they have this predisposition. So talk to us about how higher levels of plasmalogens might mitigate APOE4 status. Can we neutralize that genetic risk factor? Are the plasmalogen levels potentially even more deterministic of cognitive outcome than the APOE4 itself. Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, APOE4 itself is actually not a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. I repeat that. Okay. APOE4 statistically is not associated with Alzheimer's disease if you measure its downstream effect, okay, which is the amyloid formation. So, he, so this is just straight up hardcore science fact. If you take the brain, the postmortem brain analysis of individuals with, with different levels of cognitive impairment, and you measure brain pathology with their genotype and their biochemistry, you will find that if you don't know anything about the brain of the human being, APOE4 is predictive of dementia. There's there's people that people with APOE4 genotype will have twice the rate of dementia than some without. That's a fact. But then if you take a look at the people, then if you say, okay, why don't I measure brain amyloid levels? Because see, not everybody with an E4 genotype has high brain amyloid. Some do, some don't. And what happens is that people with an E4 genotype are more likely to have brain amyloid than someone without an E4 genotype. So then if you say, if I look at brain amyloid levels, and I, I also ask the question, okay, what's more important, brain amyloid or your E4 genotype? Then you find out that the E4 genotype has no relationship at all to dementia or cognitive impairment if you know the amyloid levels. Because all that's important is APOE4 has some sort of prediction of as to your amyloid levels. But once you measure your amyloid levels, I don't need to know what your EPO, I don't need to know your E4 status. Okay. Then so now we have amyloid levels. Okay, we say, okay, well, amyloid levels, if I don't know anything else about the human brain, amyloid levels are associated with reduced cognition. But what happens if I know other things about the cellular health of the brain? If I know the the the, the neurofibular tangle levels, or if I know the phospholipid levels, okay, or lipid raft levels, 
Then you find out that if you know that part of the brain, amyloid has that zero association with cognition. Okay, people have high levels of amyloid. If they have healthy levels of plasmalogens, the amyloid has zero association with cognitive impairment. This is straight up fact. So the point of the story of this is that the ApoE4 genotype has certain biochemical risk factor associated with it. Okay, but that is silent until that risk factor occurs, which is the amyloid. And what drives and the reason why ApoE4 shows up as a risk factor is you're not getting Alzheimer's in your 20s with an E4, right? You're not getting it in your 30s. Okay, what, what ApoE4 does is it, it it moves the aging curve back. Okay, that's all. It's, it's basically saying from a... And the aging curve is being driven by this plasmalogen depletion. So as your plasmalogens decrease, E4 becomes a bigger risk factor because you... You can't, it's 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 more dependent upon the plasmalogen levels than an E3 carrier or an E2 carrier. So if you restore the plasmalogen levels in the brain, E4 has no risk association with dementia anymore. And so this is where biochemistry comes in. It's it, things have a reason behind them. Okay. And and you have to understand, and it's a causation. And I tell, I know I'm, on a tangent, for some people, it's how these statistics work out. It's it's like saying, okay, I use this analogy in the book. Statistically, I say, you know what? 50% women get twice as many scalp rashes than men. Okay. It's, say that's a fact. Okay. And we don't know why. Well, what? Well, why? Why is it that women getting these, these scalp rashes? Why are they getting versus men? Is it because they're, they're double X chromosome? Is it because they got estrogen? What is it about being a woman that's given these women head rashes that men don't have, right? So what is it about being a female? Then someone says, hmm, you know what? I found out that women use hairspray twice as much as men do. And so, but not all women use hairspray and some men do use hairspray. And so then I say, you know what? Let me just look the question of the, the rate of scalp rashes in hairspray usage. And you say, well, once I do that, it makes no difference whether you're a man or a female. It determines whether or not you're using hairspray or not. So it's the hairspray that's actually causing the head rash, not the fact that you're a girl. Okay? Just the fact is that twice as many girls use hairspray, so twice as many girls get, get the head rashes. So it has nothing to do with you being a male or a female. It has to do with your hairspray usage. And then you can go further down and say, well, is it all hairsprays? Or is it just some hairsprays that are causing head rashes? And then you can find out, oh, you know what? Here is the one toxic molecule that's causing the head rashes. It has nothing to do with your gender. It has nothing to do with the hairspray. The, what's going on is this element in this. ApoE4 is like that. Okay, it's saying, okay, clearly twice as many people with E4 get Alzheimer's versus E3s. That's a fact. The question is, is why? Okay, what what is it? What what is it that's what's caused what why what what is what is the reason behind that? And if you know the reason behind it, then you can counteract it. And the reason behind it is that E4 has a cholesterol clearance rate difference. Okay, it, they're cholesterol savers. And so they are more dependent upon the other compensatory mechanisms that most young people all have. And the, so that's what, that's what understanding these genetic risk factors are. Same thing with the BRCA genotype for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. It's question is why? What is the biochemical mechanism of that reality? And that's where biochemistry comes in as giving us actual real solutions to solving these problems. So there, there are those people that think that amyloid is a cause of Alzheimer's. I think more and more people are understanding that that may actually be the body's response to another insult, an infection, that amyloid may actually have beneficial properties, antimicrobial properties, for example. So I'm wondering, will increasing plasmalogen levels prevent an unnecessary high level of amyloid accumulation, or will it also reverse that or lower it once present? And could it potentially reduce the amyloid such that we're removing some of that protective mechanism of the amyloid when we still have a fire that's actually in play? I, I, I really don't have a sensitive way of saying this, but that's just adolescent fantasy. I'm sorry. There really is. It's just look. Amyloid is a good biomarker of the brain. 
-hmm. Okay. You shouldn't have it in the brain. No one's going to say, oh, amyloid is good for you. No, it's not. Okay. It shouldn't be there. But the reason it's there is strictly because of the cholesterol regulation of the membranes. Period. Okay. It has this idea of trying to find some positive nature that there's some sort of stimulatory sponge activity. Okay. That is just pure scientific fantasy. I'm sorry. There's no, there's no polite way of saying that. No, I love it. Don't be, don't be sorry. <laughs> because it's, it's not true. And if, because it's not, but people have to realize that nature abhors a vacuum. Okay. You can't have a hole in your head. Okay. If you have a hole in your head, it's going to get filled with something. Okay. So when you, when you get brain atrophy, when you have amyloid will fill in those cracks or other things. Well, and this is where you get this opportunistic infections of the brain. Okay. Like if you have a, a void, Something's going to fill it. And so these type of situations are amyloid is, first of all, amyloid is a great biomarker of the brain. Like, don't get me wrong. I think it's a wonderful thing to look at because it's a good measure of membrane structure and function. It's a great biomarker of that. Okay. And so having low brain amyloid is a good indicator of good brain health. Absolutely. Same thing with neurofibular tangles. It has a different mechanism. But yeah, but in terms of its causation pathway, amyloid is not toxic. We've known this since the 90s, big studies by BRAC and BRAC. This is not up for question. The only time what happens, if, if you pump someone with a with massive levels of amyloid, okay, yeah, you're going to have an adverse event. But in the average aging population, it is not causative of Alzheimer's, of, of, of dementia, of dementia. It's, it's obviously Alzheimer's. It, that's the definition of Alzheimer's is tangles and plaques. Like that's what Alois Alzheimer's discovered in 1906 or whatever it was. So that's clearly Alzheimer's, but the cognitive impairment part is, is not related to amyloid. Do plasmalogens have an equally beneficial effect in Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, and does increasing plasmalogen levels have a similar effect in terms of symptom improvement in subjective cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's, or do we need to intervene early in the process to get more obvious benefits? Well, we find short-term benefits more in the heavily demented people quite frankly. And so it's the opposite. We actually see positive effects faster to a greater degree, the more demented the person is, because there's more of, of a window of improvement. Okay. MCI is a little more difficult to deal with. Um, MCI is kind of unknown cognitive impairment. We don't, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. People kind of toggle back in, in and out of it type of thing. But when people start getting to a mild to moderate dementia, they don't revert. They don't just normally just get better randomly. Okay. A certain percent will because there'll be some biological underlying cause with it. But fundamentally that means they're they're on a they're on a they're on a fairly well defined timeline at that point in time. And age related cognitive decline is clearly where the plasmalogens have the greatest impact. And you're always going to have mixed pathologies in the brain. Okay. This idea that you have Alzheimer's dementia and you have Lewy body dementia and you have vascular dementia and you have one versus the other, that again, okay, is academic fantasy. It just doesn't actually happen that way. You have mixed pathologies. Okay. It's extremely rare. You have very small percentage of people that will, that'll have just amyloid pathology in the brain. Okay. For example, or, or just Lewy body. Like they'll have, they'll have a, one will be a greater contributor versus another. But they don't. It, it doesn't occur that way. The brain health decreases, and you get you get multiple pathologies in the brain. Okay, not just one. So, in terms of the cognition process, once you understand the cognitive process is actually developed is is related to the cholinergic system. Okay, then it's really irrelevant from a symptomatic perspective what the underlying causation was. Okay, and so the answer is it works equally in all all factors. So you mentioned the cholinergic neuron system. It's responsible for cognition, the release of acetylcholine involved in creating and retrieving memory. Reduced mental function can be caused by a reduction in acetylcholine neuron transmission. Reduced muscle function, sarcopenia can also be related to acetylcholine neuron function. How do DHA plasmalogens impact the cholinergic neuron function? Yeah, so the cholinergic neurons are really the canary in the coal mine 
of neurological decline associated with plasmalgin deficiencies. Okay. And so, uh, so when you have a plasmalgin deficiency, it's clearly affecting all parts of your brain. It's affecting the GABAergic system. It's affecting the glutamergic system. It's the dopamine. It's affecting all systems because that synaptic function that I was telling you about, that's every single neuron in the brain functions that way. The question is, why does there appear to be a selective or accelerated decline of the cholinergic system? What makes the cholinergic system somewhat different and more sensitive to a plasmalogen deficiency than other neuron systems? And that falls into how the cholinergic neuron regenerates its pulsing activity. And that's the how choline gets taken back up into the neuron, repackages acetylcholine. And that is unique. There's a unique mechanism in cholinergic neurons that is highly dependent upon membrane structure. And this is that reuptake of the choline. The reuptake of the choline occurs through this choline hyphenity transporter. And that transporter only gets expressed during vesicular fusion, whereas a serotonergic neuron or a dopaminergic neuron, the the the, the proteins that that suck the dopamine back up after a nerve impulse, they're all they're they're always sitting there. Okay, they're just they're just sitting there waiting for a dopamine molecule to suck it back up. Cholinergic system doesn't do that because choline is a nutrient. Choline, all your cells require choline. Not all your cells get dopamine. Just dopamine neurons get dopamine, right? And so. So the cholinergic cells have de developed a system that says, you know what, I can't suck choline up from all over the place simultaneously. I need to have a, an activity-dependent uptake system. So in the cholinergic neuron is when the neurotransmitters get released, that's when the uptake protein gets expressed. And so what happens in plasmalogen deficiencies is that this synaptic neurotransmitter release is impaired. and that doesn't just affect the release of acetylcholine into the synapse it affects the uptake of choline back into the neuron so it has a double so plasmalogen deficiencies have a double whammy on the cholinergic neuron that doesn't affect the other neurons as much and that's why we see this the the first like the canary in the coal mine is this reduced cognitive functioning with plasmalogen deficiencies and that's why there's such a strong correlation I want to talk a little bit about the cholesterol connection to plasmalogens. In the book, you say that cholesterol and phosphatidylcholine are the yin to polyunsaturated fatty acids containing ethanolamine plasmalogens, which are the yang. Higher cholesterol on PC result in stiffer, more rigid membranes. Higher PUFAs result in more fluid membranes. It sounds like we need both the cholesterol and PC as well as the plasmalogens, but also sounds like maybe beyond being yin and yang, that maybe there's also some counter influence there in terms of membrane fluidity. So what is the ideal cell membrane state? Yeah, that's a really good point. And remember, phosphatidylcholine is another thing that I am a big, that's another big deficiency as we get older that really affects our health. So because it drives a reverse cholesterol transport system dramatically. So your choline levels and low choline, high, like Virtually anyone that gets pancreatic cancer has a choline deficiency. Lots of cancers associated with this thing. So choline deficiencies are, are a big deal. And one of the biggest deals about them is their effect on the cholesterol system. And this is, again, where it comes down to interpreting blood results appropriately. is Because when we talk about the membranes, it's the membrane. We're not measuring membranes in a blood test. Okay, We're measuring the general equilibrium out there. And that's why high HDL, moderately good cholesterol in the, in the low 200s, okay, is an indicator that your cellular regulation is in proper condition, which means your cells are making cholesterol and they're exporting cholesterol, okay? And that means, and if your cells are exporting cholesterol efficiently, that means that the cholesterol in your membranes are not being built up, okay? It's, it's so, so that's why low cholesterol is actually a bad thing because it's telling you that your cells are not releasing it. And that's why specifically low HDL is a very, very bad risk factor for so many different things. Because if you have low HDL levels, that means your cells are trapping cholesterol. And they, they can't, and the membrane, so when, so when the cholesterol builds up in the membrane, the membrane gets stiffer and proteins don't work properly. And that's where it goes in. So, and that's where the cholesterol phosphocholine in the membrane process that creates a stiffer membrane. And it's, and, it's, and it's driven fundamentally from impaired cholesterol regulation. 
right? Like your cell, your, your membranes of your cell are like the thermostat on your wall. Okay, your body regulates how much is in there. Okay, when there's too much, okay, it turns on the air conditioning. It says, okay, let's get rid of some of the stuff. If it's too little, it turns on the other. So your body has to continually adjust that. And it's when that thermostat stops breaking down, when you when the body can't adjust, that we have problems. So that's where the cholesterol. So the polyunsaturated ones, they deal with this other cholesterol efflux. Okay, the cholesterol acetyltransferase system and so that's why the polyunsaturates improve membrane fluidity and help compensate and they work together because everything in your body your body has a backup plan and a backup plan of the backup plan for for a lot of things right it's it's there's redundancy built into the system but that redundancy is not absolute okay you can't you can't not not everything has an has, has a complete compensation mechanism I think we know the answer to this next question, but I just want to ask it anyway to tie these concepts together. So Dr. Patricia Kane has been a mentor of mine over the years. She teaches about lipids and cell membranes and promotes the use of phospholipid replacement as well as other fats to balance the health supporting lipids in the body. So is there an overlap between her approach, which is the PK protocol and the plasmalogens are phospholipids such as phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylinositol, are those synergistic with plasmalogens? And do plasmalogens have any properties like some of the other lipids that maybe they're helping to support the body in terms of detoxification, for example? What is that overlap between these two lipid optimization approaches? Yeah, they're very complementary because they're both part of the membrane structure. The phosphatidylcholine system is a—it it really is a big deal. It should not be underestimated. We have serious choline deficiency issues in the general population that should that that have negative consequences. So, and the reason for that is choline is energetically demanding to make through the methyltransferase system, and and low choline levels are associated with high homocysteine and other things. So, so the choline supplementation strategy, absolutely one hundred percent. And in, in and as a phosphatidylcholine mechanism, the IV phosphatidylcholine, the, the brand name of one of these things is they call Plaquex or whatever it's called. Is this, it it clearly improves reverse cholesterol transport because that reverse cholesterol transport, the H, the HDL system requires phosph, phosphatidylcholine, an enzyme called LCAT, lecithin cholesterol acyl transfers. That takes when cholesterol leaves a membrane, it comes out cholesterol in the free form. It's phosphatidylcholine. That, that donates the, the fatty acid to it that goes onto the HDL particle. So when you're phosphocholine deficient, okay, when you have a, people, people with phosphocholine deficiencies, they'll often have low HDL levels, okay, because the body, because the low, cho, lo, low phosphocholine is, is, is not allowing the system to work normally. So the phosphocholine system is, is important. The other thing about phosphocholine that's important is it's one of the few phospholipids, like in, as a lysophospholipid, that'll actually cross the blood brain barrier. Very few, most lipids in the body will not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, ethanolamines, serines, these things don't go across the brain. The body, the brain makes them themselves. Lysophosphocholine will get through the, the blood-brain barrier on the CSF side. The other one is the plasmalogen precursors, so triglycerols. So alkyl glycerols and triglycerols, they will pass through not as a diacylglycerol or an alkyl acylglycerol. So th those are one of the two main mechanisms for us to get fat back in the brain. So that's why the phosphocholine system is good. The whole part of de the detox or the inflammatory component, the HDL, the phosphocholine system is, contributes to that. But the real hammer is the plasmalogen reducing the, the membrane peroxidation. Okay, because phosphocholines and those things, they don't change. They're not direct detox in terms of, of peroxidation of membranes, which are immunogenic. They're detox in the sense that they help increase HDL, help clearance, help that process. And that's the, the main issue. And then, then restoring the balance of the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory polyunsaturates. When you have inflammation of your body, enzymes called phospholipase A2s, they, they break down membrane phospholipids and they release the fatty acid at the SN2 position. They have different cascades. And that's why highly reproducible data, the, the, the DHA to arachidonic acid ratios have important impact on outcomes of, of infl inflammation. So many dots that you're connecting. This is really amazing. But just to make sure that I'm clear. So it sounds like plasmalogens do have a role in supporting detoxification in our systems. Mostly because of the 
reducing the the immunologic signal of talk when you have a toxic situation cells become peroxidated and it's the peroxidation of the membrane oxidized it's oxidized lipids that really drive the inflammation and the immunogenic cascade regardless of what the underlying cause whether it's covid whether it's a bacterial infection whether it's whatever it is right ultimately the peroxidation of the membrane is what signals the immune system say oh something's wrong here plasmalogens are direct neutralizers of those peroxidated membranes because of the, because of the vinyl ether bond and that's where that they contribute to the the main inflammation detoxification process you suggest that a cholesterol in the 220 to 240 range with an hdl in the 60 to 90 range is healthiest you note that those with higher hdl to ldo ratios have higher cognition lower dementia we know that high membrane dha plasmalogen levels enhance cholesterol efflux help to inhibit unhealthy app processing can impact the lowering of amyloid higher plasmalogen levels lead to lower triglycerides, but higher cholesterol. So wondering if you can help us understand this improving cholesterol efflux and higher cholesterol levels with higher plasmalogens. And if someone with a cognitive issue already has high ApoB, high small density LDL particles, an overall elevated lipid picture, could plasmalogen precursors potentially make things worse or will they in the long run help to balance that lipid picture? They help balance the picture. And so like I, I take a fairly simplistic approach. Like it's easy to get really into the weeds on some of this stuff because scientists love to do that. I've done it myself. But really, I, I just look at total cholesterol levels in HDL, to be honest with you. Um, these ratios for statistical studies and papers, we'll, we'll do them more fancy like that. But for the average everyday person, you want to have healthy total cholesterol levels in the low 200s, okay? As soon as it gets below 200 for total cholesterol, your all-cause mortality starts going up, okay, period. And your HDL level should be in that 60 to 90 range. When it gets down to 50, certainly when it gets down below 50 in the 40s, okay, a whole bunch of risk factors come in. And fun, and it just, it just relates to two simple things. It's that the HDL tells you that your cells are making cholesterol and exporting them. Okay, that's what it's selling. And your tells you that your reverse cholesterol transport is working. If it's low, you want to look for your whether your fossil choline levels are low or your plasma allergens are that'll also contribute those two things. Or niacin is another big thing. Your your NAD level and niacin is another big HDL contributor. So those are the, that's the thing. So the triglycerides indicate that you have good peroxidome function, but you have good fatty acid metabolism. You want to keep it under 100. Okay, when it gets when triglycerides get over 100, it indicates that either your mitochondria or your proxomes are not properly metabolizing fatty acids. Fundamentally, just that's all it means. Okay, and so the question is, is why is your mitochondria stressed or are your proxomal function being impaired? Which is why resistance training, fasting diet, all these things you'll notice that they all have very similar general outcomes triglyceride lowering. HDL elevating over and over again, you'll see that kind of pattern. And so if you see anything out there that you see that does those two things from a nutritional perspective or a behavioral perspective, okay, that's good. That's that means that you're it's helping regulate the body's energy balance. And so yeah, so that's where plasmalogens come in. They improve the they they're proxomal stimulating and cholesterol supporting molecules. You talked about the minimal impact of diet in terms of plasmalogens that we're not necessarily getting them from the diet. We're not really absorbing them from the diet. But in terms of overall lipid picture, are there any dietary ideas or strategies that you have like olive oil, for example, you mentioned in the book, we talked a little bit about fish oil. What other lipid optimization should we be considering from a dietary perspective? And does that really have any role then in terms of our endogenous endogenous plasmalogen production. Yeah, so the endogenous plasmalogen production is really driven from a dietary perspective in terms of, of your maintenance of your fasting state and making sure that you have proper B vitamin nutrition and, and so on. So proper supplementation of those situations. The nutritional availability of plasmalogens is virtually non-existent. And the reason for that is that when your body makes plasmalogens, the final step creates this vinyl ether bond. And it is designed specifically to neutralize peroxides. Okay. It, it is designed to be super, super sensitive to peroxides and it breaks, it 
it neutralizes it. It, it gets it gets blown apart. It gets broken down by acid. And so when you eat a nice juicy steak or you eat an animal product that has plasmalogens in them, as soon as that hits the hydrochloric acid of your stomach, they're gone. Okay? They don't make it past the stomach or the upper intestine because it, because it's, it's the your stomach is is concentrated hydrochloric acid. It's there to protect you from bacteria and other things. You have it's, it's, your, it's your first stomach acid is the first line of defense of human digestion, and it, it and so it destroys all these plasmalogens full stop. And that's why human breast milk doesn't have plasmalogens. It has plasmalogen precursors. Okay. It has these alkyl glycerols. That's what's in human breast milk. And they survive. They don't, they're, they're untouched by the acid in the stomach and they go right into the blood supply and into your brain. Which is also true of the supplements that you have formulated. That's exactly right. And so dietary, I'm a big fan of a balanced diet. I don't really like a bunch of fads. I think the time-restricted eating is, is important. I think you should have a high protein diet with good fat like the egg 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 oil type fatty meats with some with some decent fiber or vegetables so basically i'm a i'm a meat and low glycemic index vegetable kind of guy and then if you need to have a bit of a snack if you're taking your supplements in the morning or at night just make sure it's a nice high protein high fat snack basically and that's and i think then you can live your life i think you don't you don't have to get super crazy if you have other things that you're that you're doing in your program, but a good round and then, and have a variety of your diet. Because remember, nobody knows all the answers to this stuff. They have to remember, we're all guessing to a certain degree on some of this stuff. So you have to kind of fuzzy some stuff in there and realize, okay, there's a reason why good diverse diet happens because you might be getting something from one nutrient versus another that you, and you just need, it might, you just, you just might need it a little bit here and there. So keep your diet balanced, but within that kind of range is my, my, general rule of thumb. And then you can then you can also enjoy your life too. I was recently listening to a lecture from Dr. David Musnick, who is an expert on traumatic brain injuries. And he commented in that talk that plasmalogens was an area that he was just starting to explore, wondering, do plasmalogens play a role in those with traumatic brain injuries? Absolutely. Especially the omega-9. It's pretty much a concussion pre prevention molecule. If you have a kid playing football or hockey, I would be recommending taking proton glia two hours before every game because you want to have that present. Concussion is a brain inflammation event. And that's a whole, so yeah, absolutely. So the biggest things for concussions are make sure we get blood flow to the area of insult because it, that's the other part of the brain. The brain's got to fix itself from the inside out right? When you bruise your shoulder, you've got lots of circulatory system that can actually remove that stuff, okay? Your brain does not have that level of circulatory system. So every study on earth that has that has increased blood flow to the concussed area improves TBI outcomes, period, full stop, okay? So if you can improve the circulatory system in the area of the concussion, you get better improvements, absolutely. Second part is from the inside of the brain, okay? That inflammatory component is really a, a white matter issue. Most people with concussions don't recover from the concussion. They adapt to the concussion. Okay, The neural inflammatory component of concussion lasts a very, very long time. It can last forever. And what happens is when you get these athletes, we give them the return to play designations, the inflammatory component of their brain hasn't actually gone away. They have just mapped around it. They have adapted to it. And that's why we have these longer-term that's why secondary concussions, or that's why we have these long-term effects, and especially if you get a big head injury in children, okay, you might not notice the difference for 10 years. These other psychiatric diseases that are associated with early head injuries are quite a large number. And so head injury is a very interesting thing. So yeah, plasmalogens are critical because that's, that's, that's an inflammation of the brain. Making sure you can restore that membrane myelination process is core absolutely core to concussion research and prevention. Through your company, Prodrome Sciences, you offer the Prodrome Scan. I'm wondering if you can talk to us about some of the key insights that one might gain from that, and what does the test really measure? Why did you select some of those specific measurements as indicators of health? Yeah, so the Prodrome Scan test is kind of like your biochemistry 101. It's for doctors that that have had all this diagnostic experience with the basic blood testing. And it teaches them how to interpret human biochemistry 
in a more comprehensive, holistic way and understand how the pieces fit together. And so it, it selectively deals with the real core issues. So we talk about membrane structure and function. So the membrane structure, the phospholipids, the ethanolamines, plasmalogens, cholines are, are laid out so we can see how that, that phospholipid metabolism of the human body is working. Then it looks at the fatty acid distribution, not total fatty acid, because when you're looking at total fatty acids in red cell membranes and so on and so forth, you're dealing with you're not dealing with the active fatty acids. You're, you're, things are mixed in there. So we actually measure fatty acid distributions actually on the phospholipid backbone. So it's actually phospholipids, and we measure the individual fatty acids and look at the core ratios to make sure that that is because that's what's actually happening when you get a phospholipase A2 event. Like the, that's that's actually what's being generated in the human body, and we can we can optimize that. There are certain gut microbiome metabolites called GTAs that are very, very potent anti-inflammatories, very potent anti-cancer molecules. When they're low, they're highly predictive of future colon pancreatic cancer. So we measure those simply. Anemia, especially in younger people, you want to keep an eye on that. And then methyltransferase function, we build up with homocysteine. This is one of the one of the really core systems of human physiology that is a weak link. That's why people are taking homocysteine lowering meds, but it's it's or supplements, but it's really about methyltransferase system. And it's making sure that you have, and then look at the single myelin to ceramide ratios. So we, we get a better picture of the fact is, is your body got proper methyl transferase capacity? And then mitochondrial function, we look at mitochondrial leakage, because if mitochondria aren't working, the acetylcholine leaks out and goes into fatty acid elongation. So we, we measure that. Proxosomal function, I'm looking at the plasmalogen ratios and also the DHA to EPA ratios tell us how proxosomal beta oxidation is working and your simple fasting triglycerides. So you get a sense of that in combination with the mitochondrial function, cholesterol transport, HDL, total cholesterol, that type of thing. And then we look at oxidate, like uric acid and creatinine. I use creatinine. The, the traditional use for it is for kidney clearance. I'm more concerned about sarcopenia and muscle wasting. The big issue. So creatine deficiencies are big issues. So people get these low creatinine levels. So much more concerned about low creatinine than high Obviously, if you have high, you have kidney issues that you deal with those situations. But those low creatinine is a big problem for people that are trying to stay young, long. You need to be on your creatine. You need to make sure that you don't become creatinine deficient, which means you're basically muscle wasting. And people don't even know it. Like they, think they're, they think they're doing all the right things and they're, they're wasting away. Uric acid is another biomarker that is totally misinterpreted dramatically. Again, people think about high uric acid for gout. But really, the big problem for longevity in neurology is low uric acid. When your uric acid levels get low, it's basically it's an indicator of NAD deficiencies. Virtually all neurological diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, central nervous system viral infections, all of these will have low uric acid levels. And low uric acid is a good indicator of NAD deficiencies. So it's it's low uric acid is a far more dangerous situation than 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 high. High is and very interesting little tidbit, people with gout have higher cognitive functioning than people without gout. So so just so high uric acid is actually associated with high cognitive function. The proton scan is designed as this kind of biochemistry 101 test. It looks at the key systems, puts it all in one kind of in your face, and you kind of see so you, you can interpret, uh, you can understand the person in front of you. And I was looking at, it, hey, is there a boogeyman under the bed that I had no way, no way of knowing it's there? Fixed everything in there is modifiable through diet and supplementation and, and behavior. And then the goal is to get get these core systems working. And then you can go into greater detail in other areas. So there's thousands and thousands of types of tests that people can run. I think it's a very exciting test. I have a family member who uh, just recently had the test done, which is part of what really spurred my interest into uh, exploring your work in more detail. When would you suggest that someone do this testing, which looks at all of those factors, but also is looking at the plasmalogens? If someone has no symptoms of cognitive decline, should it be done as a preventative screening, much like Dr. Bredesen talks about a cognoscopy? And then how often after doing the tests should one repeat? it to see if their supplemental exogenous plasmalogen precursors are moving them in the right direction. Yeah, the gen general, you should get it as soon as possible. So the other thing we do is we biobank your blood samples. Okay, so when you get a blood sample sent to us, it doesn't get thrown in the garbage. It gets stored at minus 80 degrees. So three years later, 
we can go back and double check on things, right? So that's a big thing. So you want to get this, you want to, you want to kind of get a, like a computer restore point. So the point is get a blood test. I would tell anyone to get it right away. And so you have the blood sample sitting in the freezer for future reference, but also get understanding. Is there anything that I might be doing all the things I'm, uh, I think is right, but is it actually doing what I wanted to do? Right. And then from there you get, a, you can get a quick homework assignment of depending upon what you need to optimize. And then about three months later, you can do a follow-up test. Then after that, once a year is fine. Just keep keep an eye on things and do the things that you're excited about doing. But try to get the goal here is to reduce this unpredictable fear, right? People are worried. A lot of this health is a walk down the street. I get hit by lightning and I have a disease. Where the hell did that come from? Right? It, it's like this. And so you live in this kind of fear that of the unknown. And the test is designed, you know, not not to solve every single problem in the world, but look at the big ones. And say, okay, there's not these really big lurking dangers. Then you can kind of check on a on a semi-regular basis that you're on the right track. And that's that's the, the concept of it. And we'll and we'll expand it. There's some there's some other core components that we'll add. So in the plasmalogen precursor realm, you have the prodrome neuro, which is the omega-3 plasmalogens, the prodrome glia, which is the omega-9 plasmalogens. How long would someone normally take these exogenous plasmalogen precursors to, to really improve their symptoms, to optimize their plasmalogens? And then once their levels are restored, is that something they generally need daily for life? Or is there then a maintenance period or a pulsing strategy? What's the long-term picture look like? People should think of it like vitamins in a sense, right? You can go and get your B12 test done, for example, but does that mean you stop taking B12 supplements? No, like you still want the nutritional optimization of our food supply. I think you do for the rest of your life, fundamentally, and you treat it that way. It's a precursor. So it's not, you measure the blood levels to show that you've, you've refilled the tanks, okay, which is great. I take plasma medicines every single day. I take my neuro in the morning, my glee at night. Okay. My, trust me, my levels are good because I, I make the stuff. And so, but every day I take it because I, I feel it, it gives me that energy every morning. Every, it gets caught because it's a, it's a precursor. So every day it has a 12 hour, the, the tank gets filled, but you get this boost in your cells every day. So this, that was the other real interesting thing over the last couple of years that we've seen so many people in, in my own personal experience is that. There is an acute benefit as well as a long-term benefit. And we don't know all the answers. We know that we know from an epidemiological perspective, these low levels are bad. We don't know what the optimal levels really are. And these kids, these kids with raised rare diseases, leukodystrophies, they're on really high doses. They're like 10 mils or more. They're drinking this stuff and getting better. And so it's it's something. Again, as we were telling you before, that scientists have to be really careful about the arrogance of science. We sometimes we 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 have to remember we never ever know everything, okay? And we, we the best we work on the best approximations, and then kind of make sure you have a feedback loop with yourself. You're always you are always the best determiner of what's working, and people should expect results from their their programs. I'm I'm guessing just with the level of cognition that you have that you're probably taking at least a full bottle of those every day because <laughs> something Not quite that much something is working. Just to clarify, I'm sure people have the question. My understanding is that the raw materials that go into these supplements are all vegan, vegetarian. That they're plant derived. They do not contain any fish oils or any animal type products. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the capsule, the gelatin capsules, of course, are not vegan. I think there's a new version coming out that have that, but they come in a full oil form. But yeah, it is very important. We, this is a highly pure manufacturing process. Okay, so we take the omega-3 plasmalogen, which is the DHA fatty acid. We drive that that fatty acid from algae oil, a high, high purity, high DHA concentration. We take that algae oil, Okay, the stuff that you would normally buy on Amazon or wherever you buy your, your supplement. We take that and we actually digest it. Okay, we saponify it the way you make soap. We, we strip all the fatty acids off of the glycerol backbone because that, that's just a, a regular triglycerol, just like your oil in your cupboard, for example. Okay, we strip off the glycerol backbone. We get the pure fatty acid. Then we, we, we purify the DHA component of it. So we go from a regular LJ oil, we'll have maybe 50%. 60% maybe if you're lucky around that 50% to 60% omega-3 in it. 
We then take it through a purification process and it becomes 95% omega-3. It's the highest purity concentrated omega-3 in the world, DHA. Then we take that purified DHA, which is from an animal, from a plant source, from the algae source. And then we put it on a plasmalogen backbone. And then we put it in a bottle and that's it. There's nothing in it. We have clove oil and cinnamon oil over time because those high polyunsaturates have, they get oxidative stress over time. That will probably be removed. So that's how the D omega-9, that's how the omega-3 proteoneuro was made. And that's why it's really high purity omega-3. And it's very, the bioavailability is, is really quite amazing. Then the omega-9, we get the oleic acid. We take that from a plant source, from a high oleic acid sunflower oil. Okay, again, same process. It's like 95% oleic acid type oil. We saponify it to get the free fatty acid, LJ, purify it, and then we put it on. So now you get two very pure sources. You get a very high purity omega-9 that when you take it, it goes directly into these oligodendrocytes of your cells. It goes right into the white matter with a very high potency. And then the omega-3, again, it's very high potency, very specific for very purpose. And that's why that's why it works. It's, it's pretty cool. That's what it, so it's made. Are there any contraindications or any common side effects that people have with plasmalogen precursor supplements? No, nothing directly. The oil, the DHA oil has a bit of a taste to it if you take the liquid form, okay? Um, I still take the liquid because I like the faster acting. The gelatin capsules, but then I'm used to it. But a lot of people say they can't take the oil because it just tastes too bad. That's just life. But the gel capsules are fine. The negative side effects really... For people with ADHD, for example, and autism, I, t I tell them to be cautious about the omega-3. It kind of, it, it gets them, you got to peel them off the wall because it's quite activating. So glia is the, the the calming nature for the ADHD people. People can adjust their dose for sleep at night. Some of our staff, they'll say, if I take eight capsules, I have a hard time getting up in the morning because I'm so sleeping so deeply. And then, so they kind of titrate back down to like six, four to six capsules at night. So that it's a back and forth process. The negative side effects, really, there's there isn't anything of that we have. We have these kids with rare diseases on massive doses. And well, there'll be some people with a little bit of GI, but normally it fixes GI issues. A lot of people, their 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 GI, the mega the glia especially really improves gut function. But yeah, no, we don't have and contradictions, we haven't seen any. I'm going to have to get out my uh, prodrome glia and my aura ring and uh, see how my sleep shifts with that. That uh, sounds like another fun little experiment to do. We do find people, some people have to back it off from nighttime. I take mine right at bedtime. Even, and even simple things like it's weird, restless leg syndrome. If you take a high dose of the glia, it'll it'll get rid of the restless legs and a lot of people too. Wow. And so it's, uh, but some people say it actually wakes me up at night because it actually reduces the inflammation and it goes, oh, they're kind of awake at night. So they, they take it earlier, say three or four hours. So if you do find that glia is not putting to sleep right away, and it's actually making you awake a bit more than you'd like to be, then just back it back a few hours before bedtime is what people tell me. My last question is the same for every guest, and I'm going to adapt it slightly for you. But what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? And then what are some of the key supplements that you prioritize for your own health optimization? Yeah, so I'm a big believer. So I take every, I'll tell you exactly what I take every day. So I'm a coffee drinker. So in my morning coffee, I put a scoop of creatine in it and a scoop of collagen proteins that's just i just mix it with my coffee that's why your to... skin looks so good probably right <laughs> <laughs> and so that's my that's my, my my coffee and then i have i make all my b vitamins i, I go so I, I have 100 milligrams of b1 thiamine 100 milligrams of b2 riboflavin take 500 milligrams of niacin i take the not the niacin of mine not not the, not the anti-flush but the actual flushing kind but i take a slow release capsule 500 milligrams i take some branched chain amino acids with that because that branched chain amino acids improve nice and function then i take my carnitine i take about a couple grams of carnitine a day so twice a day acetyl l carnitine coq10 take 100 milligrams of that and acetylcysteine i'm a big fan of that i take two grams of that a day a gram in the morning gram late afternoon these curcuminoids which are these gtas bdmc we have a special formulation that's really about 50 to 100 times more potent than the regular turmeric has the special curcuminoid in it and so i take three capsules of that 
a day. It's just like curcuminoids. Then the methyltransferase system, I'll take my, take a B12, take a milligram of that, take a, a methylfolate, B6, 100 milligrams of B6. And every now and then I'll put, I'll, it's every day or so I'll take maybe an alpha lipoic acid and a, a betaine on the methyltransferase system. I think that's about it every day. Just a multi-mineral, and that's basic stuff. And then, then from a nutritional perspective, I'll make a little shake. We have a, or we'll have a nutrient shakes, but you can get egg yolk powder, okay, powdered egg yolk, and so you can make smoothies with it. So I make a little cocktail. I take whey protein, egg yolk powder, and I mix it with some coconut milk, the pure stuff, the cooking coconut stuff, right? Not not the not the coconut drink stuff, the actual pure coconut stuff. That's a, a nice little good fat, good protein, got your phospholipids in there. And then you can have a little half a cup, a little bit of that with my supplements, right? So I can just have that. It's completely, oh, and then I'll put a scoop of trailos in there. So it's a, so I use, so, so I'll sweeten it with trailos and then, and then I'll put a little bit of maple syrup for sweetening. Don't get any of the artificial sweetener stuff, but maple syrup itself has very low glycemic index. People think sugar, sugar always has these glycemic indexes. That's not true. The actual maple syrup has actually a very low insulin response. So trailose is a real amazing little sugar. So what it basically is, it's it's a it's a di, di, disaccharide. It's a two glucose molecules and it's a slow releasing glucose. So when you take, say when you take a starchy high glycemic index carbohydrate like a potato or something that gets digested very quickly into glucose so you get this glucose spike and this is what causes this glycemic index spike of insulin sensitivities that we have with meals trailose is a slow 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 releasing sugar so it's sweet so it's a sweetener but it's a slow releasing sugar and what it does not only is it slow releasing it actually blocks the fast release of glucose from regular carbohydrates so if you drink trailos before a meal, it will reduce the insulin spike of your meal. Okay, so if I go to McDonald's and have a Big Mac and fries, okay, then, but if I have, a, say, a trailos drink 20, 30 minutes before that, the insulin effect of my, my Big Mac meal, okay, will be like half. I, I'm guessing you don't actually eat Big Mac meals. <laughs> I I eat everything every now and then. So I no, I don't eat a lot of Big Macs. But I'll have the I'll have fatty ribs. So I have I have my guilty pleasures as well. So but that's but that's where a trail is. Cause it, nice. so you add the sweetener, then I just add a little bit of and you can get some good chocolate syrups that are just uh that are not, that are made with with the the right pure sugars, right? And and if you get those right sugars, they they're they're not bad for you. If you don't want that's where the trail is basically cuts the, the the amount of other. So that's 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 what I have. I feel like your next book needs to be a recipe book for uh, highly optimized people that we could start putting some of these things together. I'm a big fan of my power shake every day as well. I've had my tablespoon of PC blend this morning uh, also. So I just loved the the whole conversation. You were very generous with your time, but I learned a lot, connected lots of little dots. I mean, there were sentences you threw out here and there that connected more things for me. The book is amazing. And they say that if you want to be smarter, to surround yourself with smarter people. And today, spending time with you, I definitely feel a little bit smarter. So thank you so much, Dr. Goodenow, for all the work that you do and for spending time with us today. Thank you, Scott. It was a pleasure. To learn more about today's guest, visit drgoodenow.com. That's Dr. D-R Goodenow.com. Dr. Goodenow.com. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a positive rating or review, as doing so will help the show reach a broader audience. To follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. To be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. This and other shows can be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.